safety yeah. board. Anna will set that up for you, too. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, President Rubio. Trustees, it is my pleasure no, okay. to introduce you to Thomas Woodland. He will be providing us with an overview of the emergency operations that we are working on implementing in the district. And I am going to turn it over to him so that he can introduce himself. Thank you. Good evening, board and uh, constituents. Uh, my name is Tom Woodland. I'm the uh, district emergency uh, preparedness and school safety coordinator for our district. So we'll go right into it. Um, just as a side note, uh, I was, uh, had an opportunity to collaborate with uh, uh, board member Euchides when he was the chief over at Monterey Regional Fire District, and I was at the EMS agency. So that collaboration was really well received and hope to continue that collaboration as well. I worked in the field for 14 years, um, and my most recent emergency management experience was at Public Health uh, in San Benito County. My general role here with the district is to do emergency preparedness planning, school safety and security, respond to school incidents, and report on school site safety plans. Those are my main priorities for the district. So what we're looking into tonight is our overview of uh, the proposed district emergency operations manual, which um, you have a preview of that um, that was attached to the uh, board agenda, both as the uh, comprehensive school safety plans and our district-wide emergency operations manual. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at what our flip charts and policies do, uh, preparedness, mitigation, responses to incidents, and then we'll take a quick overview of what uh, the the operations manual will do when we have an emergency event. So essentially what we're looking at here is uh, on our flip charts and policies. Flip charts and policies may have been good some time ago, but now with the expansion of different situations, uh, situational awareness and responses to different um, emergencies, they're not enough. They're, they're just simply not enough. And flip charts, um, for us or uh, folks that are in the uh, educational side, um, it's a simple guide for them to just roll through a, a process, whether it be evacuate or um, uh, active shooter. And policies are only reactionary to incidents. We always make a policy later on after something happens because that's what the safest thing to do is to make that policy. So with that, with our district emergency operations manual, what it's going to do for us, it's gonna give guidance to the administrators and our district on a wide variety of incidents, on how to respond to an incident. Now, I'm gonna tell you, nothing is ever book, never, nothing is ever 100%, but this is gonna give us some general guidance and best practices to be able to respond to an incident. It's also gonna give us general guidance on when to activate and escalate that activation response. We can organize the response, and we will inevitably do consistent training with our educators, with our admin at our schools, and with our district as a whole. This is what it'll look like if we have an incident. Uh, essentially, we have the incident, we'll have the school site. If it's at a school site, we'll end up, uh, the admin team there will uh, activate. If we have to at a district level, we'll activate there as well. And most of the time, either fire or law enforcement response, what will happen is, is they'll, they'll take over the full incident command. But that doesn't mean we're done, because we still have to operate and work as a unified command with the emergency responders, because we know our schools and our district better than the emergency responders. So that's why we call it a unified command. If we're looking at a school site incident command, incident, incident breaks out, this is what it'll look like. This is the general map. Now, mind you, this may expand or contract as needed, but our focus is life safety first. We're always looking out for everybody else to make sure that they're safe. And the same thing as the District uh, Emergency Operations Command. This is what it'll look like. Again, expanding or contracting as needed. So in summary, our EOM and our emergency operations are an important process to manage our emergencies within the district. Now, mind you, if we have a catastrophic event in the entire region and we just happen to be in school, we're going to be left to manage our own little cities because nobody's going to be there right away. They're not going to come racing to the first school that they see. They're going to be responding to the incidents as, as it comes through the queue and as fast as they can get there especially with mutual aid response. 
And so we always want to practice and revisit our plans. This is a living document, so we'll be able to reinvest our time and effort into the plan, as always. And we're always going to follow best practices. So if we learn something new, we look at our plan, and it says maybe we should change it, we're probably going to change it based on best practices. So my goal here is to make sure that our district and our schools are running smoothly and hopefully safe during the entire operation. And as always, if you need to reach out for me for anything, please contact me and my information that's listed here. And that's all I have. Do you have any questions, uh, board Thank or you. anybody? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for your presentation. As a school employee, what is the expectations of me if I'm an employee of a school site? What is required in case of an emergency? What is What am I told when I'm first hired? Am I told that there's an emergency, I'm required to stay on site? Or am I able to leave when I need to leave because i got to go to my family? What is required of me as an employee? Most of the time, uh, what will happen is if you're on site, you will initially be staying at that site until such time as we can get you relieved. So you, it depends on how the situation arises, right? So every emergency or incident is different. So it would be based on that. And the administrators on site will give that guidance on you know who can stay, who, who needs to leave, that sort of thing. And especially if we have family members who may be ill at home that you gotta go take care of, we'll find a way to get you back to that location quickly. But in the interim, in the beginning of an incident, everybody's gonna be staying put until we can figure out what the problem is and what resources do we need. Because remember, in when we have an emergency incident, if we don't use the right people at the right time, and we start uh, sending out bills to the federal government to get reimbursed for this stuff, and we don't, we didn't need this set of people, well, we're gonna be paying back money because there's auditors, and so auditors are there to take one, care. One step further? Yes. So the expectation is everybody's a first responder? That's my, that's okay. where I'm getting at. Okay. So that's, and I would like to know if employees, when they're first hired, are they given that information? Are they aware of that? Um, because my understanding, there's some employees that don't understand that. Right. So is that something that we're assuring that new employees are being informed? Yeah, we'll have to look in the documents, the onboarding documents mm -hmm. in Dr. Galicia's department to see if everybody's notified of that. If, for teachers, it's a little different. It's part of the credentialing process, that basic understanding, but I don't know about other It positions. is also within the Kinnan training, and every employee has it uh, annually. So when they are doing the five or six different um, modules, mm -hmm. one of them is does indicate that they're first responders, does indicate that they're mandated reporters, does indicate that they're there. So yes, it is. They're reminded annually as well. And just to understand, what would my role be as a first responder? It depends on what um, what course of action that we need to take. So we will we will provide each of the. Uh, personnel who's going to uh, be in a branch a role and then you'll have a job action sheet and then give you the basic parameters of what what it is that you would be doing in that particular role so you'll have guidance and your administrator will be your your lead to help you out with that process Tom can you go to slide eight sure. um, okay. there we go so with an incident command flowchart like this if I'm designated as somebody that's part of the logistics team as a first responder, then I would be working under the person in charge of logistics, working with them to ensure safety of everybody on the site as part of my role as a first responder. So, may I continue? Ahead, may I continue? Ahead, Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so, we're in this particular um, organizational chart, where would I fit in as a school employee? So I see, so I would be under staffing, because I see transportation, food services. So each of those roles that you see, those branches mm -hmm. there <coughs> underneath the, uh, the uh, section chiefs, essentially what, it, what those are is, so staffing. So for example, what we would do is we would probably put somebody from human resources in a staffing role because they they know the, the campus pretty well or or somebody in admin that does that. Um, food services would be probably somebody from the cafeteria department that would be in charge of that particular department because they deal with food services. 
So depending on what what your uh, process is, so like if you were part of... How about, um, let's use transportation as okay. an example. Sure. So transportation is uh, we're going to get buses to a, a school site. So we may put you in that position, and, and your job is to get us transportation, whether it be vans or buses. And then what you would do is you would call up to the district level, if you're at a school site level, and say, we need X number of buses. So then, then the district emergency operations will then turn around and contact Greg Allen, who's in charge of transportation, and say, hey, I need 15 buses at this site. So your specific role would be just what, within that perimeter. You wouldn't be inside or outside of that. May I ask? Go ahead. And continue? Oh, yes. Yeah. Just for the sake of conversation, for us to really understand this, to bring sure. it more into a perspective, let's use the last situation that just happened, the floods. Okay. So let's say the flood happened while we were at a school site. Okay. And I'm a bus driver. What is something that I might have been, um, what would I had to have maybe been directed to do? Or what kind of something that as a first aid responder would have to be responsible to have to do? I mean. So, you're, so, so that direction would come from the director of transportation, which would be Greg mm -hmm. Allen. And his, his directives most likely would be A, don't drive through any water that's you know, standing. Mm -hmm. Uh, keep your keep your uh, passengers safe. Um, if there are passengers that need to get onto, let's say, the other side of the river, then what we would do is we would probably take them back to the uh, home school of that location and contact parents to let them know that their their students aren't going to be able to get across on the bus. So those type of things. So the school site would help us with that. Now again, this may not all be activated like we would like in this instance because we had a a. Um, an effort with the cabinet to be able to work through this uh, flooding situation. So this won't always be activated on everything. It'll only be activated on some things. Yeah, and if I can just add to that, so um, during the floods, we actually had a situation. Um, so the manager of transportation, his task is to ensure that he gets very familiar very quickly with all the road closures, right? So we did have a road that was closed, um, and it indicated it was very specific. And it informed us that buses could not get to that location. However, the vehicles were okay, right? So it's our job to communicate to the parents immediately that the students are going to be staying on site until they until they can be picked up by their parents. So that is that is you know normally what they do in a situation like this. Thank you. Okay. Good. Yes. Sure. Okay. Yes. We'll get something else. I'll come back to you. <laughs> okay. I got to go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Just see <clears throat> In the military, we call what we have. You go back to a slide again. Sure. That, um, we call it S shops. In Army, I don't know, maybe Navy has S shops too. Sure. And so we do what we do is we constantly do a rehearsal. We assign to an S shop, um, and so we kind of rehearse uh, our S shop just so that we know we're on top of everything in case of a, uh, in case we get deployed. Do you do any rehearsals on this, and has this worked? Yes, so um, I've, I've worked in public health, so during COVID-19, I ran the entire operations for San Benito County. I was responsible for 65,000 residents. So uh, any of these type of incidents, we will always tabletop exercise, and then we will go to a full-scale exercise at some point. In this instance, because this is new, we'll have to take it through a step-by-step -step process, go through each, each site, work with the admin team, start there, do quick training and, and understanding of what's happening. And then after all the sites are complete, then we can run some type of a tabletop exercise with each site. So this is gonna be, a, it's, it will be a process. Don't, you know, this may take up to 14 months for us to actually get everybody on the same page. But then we also have to consider uh, people leaving the district, people coming in. <clears throat> so we'll also have to work on those training opportunities as well. So it looks like your flow chart uh, starts from the top incident manager all the way down. It looks like there's several layers in between before you get to the operations, logistics, and all that. How long does that take to get from incident manager all the way down to? So, so that's your that's your okay. So your top step up there is your management team. So the, all those folks just get together, and they start working on the process. Then your where it says operations, planning, intel, logistics, and finance and admin. Those are your actual, uh, your managers of those particular branches. So, the, so anything that happens from the top 
is actually coming from planning and intel. Those are the folks that get everything together, and then the rest of the team then uh, molds out. Because a lot of times your managers up top are waiting for things to do or things that, that, that need to happen. So for example, your liaison officers, people that we would bring in from the outside, contractors, they'll be looking at, they'll be managing their contracts or whatever they need, their people that come in. So if, we're, if we contract out to a construction company during an incident, they're gonna be responsible for their contract and their contract obligations, as an example. So, so the people at the top not necessarily are gonna be managing the people down below. The incident manager is the person that's waiting for uh, information from the lower level folks to be able to come up to the top. If I can reinforce that a little bit, I think uh, Trustee Rojas's question is is um, extremely relevant in the sense of the purpose we of us as a district creating the position that Tom Woodland is in, mm -hmm. and really relooking at all of our emergency plans and having somebody um, full time in place to then begin working with school sites to go through um, building not just the plan but practicing for certain types of incidents. So this is the, the step in that piece. It's a reminder to me, I wrote some notes too, I'll follow up on with, you know, at the beginning of the year is usually the time of year when people at the school site sign up for which of the areas they want to participate in. So if there is a, an emergency, they would know what team they're on. And that this is really going back to that whole um, concept though of Tom Woodland's position being able to help drive this on a day-to-day -day basis. So I appreciate his work. I also want to tell you that the value we have in Tom right now is, is also, uh, he, he talks through the, the language of emergency um, and disaster preparedness. We talk through the education talk a lot of times or through, through OSHA talk, things of that nature. But when we've had some incidents so far this year on our campuses, Tom's been great in being able to communicate with our emergency response folks. Um, and he's, he's been good at, at uh, reminding me some patience that's needed with folks because you know we, we, we have to care for kids and we have to care for the adults that care for the kids. And sometimes emergency services are about getting this done right now. And so blending those two together, it's good that we have somebody with Tom's experience. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Chair Rubio? Yes. I just want a clarification because I'm fairly new to the board. I thought that this was just like an update. So this is the first time the district is going to implement this emergency, district-wide emergency plan for but each school did have some type of emergency. So the law requires every school to, to have a comprehensive safety plan. Okay. So we've always had those in place. Right, yeah. um, the difference now is just unpacking and getting back to making sure that we can address as many, potent get in front of as many potential emergencies as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if I can just add to that, um, superintendent, so the um, comprehensive school site plans are we went ahead and we provided a draft yeah, of part of the middle schools. Um, and currently the sites have been asked to complete all of theirs and, and have a final plan by the 21st of February. Mm -hmm. And then what we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll have B send you a copy of the final plans and they'll be on for approval on, on February 28th agenda. And, um, and then in regards to the emergency operations manual, yes, this is the first time that we have that you have a um, a sample of that, but we don't have all the information what provides us for every emergency, how do we handle that, right? right. So we are not publishing that for safety reasons, of right, course, obviously, of course. right? And we are by law protected and we could do that. We can go ahead and make sure that we hold the information here at the district level and not publish that information. Yep. Go ahead. Chair, um, no, um, just to kind of also echo on what um, the question was about practicing and or do, doing the drill. I know that they still do the, I mean, they're doing drills of other emergencies other than earthquakes at the school site, sure. right? Currently, they are doing drills on yeah, other yeah. things. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. I don't have a child in high school yet. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So there's different layers of that yeah. um, that um, Tom is coordinating with mm -hmm. um, Kimball and Associates, okay. who are contracted person to work on active intruder okay. um, emergency preparedness too. So it's not just active shooter; it's a lot larger than that. Sure. Mm -hmm. sure. Thank you. Does anybody else have any any questions? Any anything you'd like to share with us? Because you did that for a living. And no, I'd, I'd like to thank Tom. We had uh, uh, back in the day when he was with the EMS agency. The one thing that the question I have is: Does a district have we adopted the National Incident Management System uh, as a resolution by the trustees? Because to Tom's point, 
Um, now, since we're going to have a plan that we're utilizing the incident command system, that in the event we have a uh, federal or state declared disaster, it would allow us to uh, get reimbursement. And yeah. that's a condition yeah. is that we've adopted a resolution saying we're going to use the we national do. incident yeah. management system. We do. So. That's yeah, there's a lot of back-end coordination. So, two of our schools are designated as Red Cross mm -hmm. relief centers in, in case they're needed, things of that nature. So there's a lot that's going on with this piece. Just in general, though, it's 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 such an important uh, reminder that we need to get um, better at what we do in terms of emergency response, and also uh, in preventing the need for emergency response as well. So, when when I used to work at the airport, we had that similar. Charge in the end. I'm glad we're doing it here. Really glad. Yeah, I, I just remember one thing when I was there and I was learning about that that you brought up was the uh, uh, they set up a desk for the person to count all, all the hours and money. So for the billing, right? And I, I found it humorous, right? I just like that. It was just some, somebody that the whole thing was just to make sure what funds were being used, hours and all that, so they could bill, to bill the federal government for, exactly. for the reimbursement. Absolutely. Yeah, I remember that. Anna, that's your role. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this told me many times. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Anything else from anybody else? Any more questions from anybody? No? Okay. So, well, that said, I think we're done. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a good evening.